be assured this narrative is no fiction. I am aware that some of my adventures may seem incredible, but they are nevertheless strictly true. I have not exaggerated the wrongs inflicted by slavery. On the contrary, my descriptions fall far short of the facts. In this hole, I lived for seven years. This attic was added to my grandmother's house years ago. Some boards were laid across the joists of the ceiling, and between these boards, there was a very small garret, never occupied by anything but rats and mice. There is no admission for either light or air. The air was stifling, the darkness total. A bed had been spread on the floor. I could sleep quite comfortably on one side, but the slope was so sudden that I could not turn on the other side without hitting the roof. The rats and mice ran over my bed. Day and night were the same in my tiny den. I suffered for air, even more than light. But I was not comfortless. I heard the voices of my children. There was joy and sadness in the sound. How I longed to speak to them. I was eager to look at their faces. But there was no hole or crack through which I could peep. The continued darkness was oppressive. It seemed horrible to sit or lie in a cramped position day after day. And yet, I chose this rather than my lot as a slave. I was born a slave, but I never knew it till six years of happy childhood passed by. My father, Daniel Jacobs, was a carpenter and was considered so intelligent and skillful in his trade that when buildings out of the common line were to be built, he was sent for from long distances to be head workman. On condition of paying his mistress $200 a year and supporting himself, he was allowed to work his trade. His strongest wish was to purchase his children and though he several times offered his hard earnings for that purpose, he never succeeded. My parents lived together in a comfortable home, and though we were all <coughs> slaves, I was so fondly shielded that I never dreamed I was a piece of merchandise. When I was six years old, my mother died. And for the first time, I learned through talk around me that I was a slave. I grieved for her, and my young mind was troubled with the thought of who would now take care of me and my little brother. I was told that my home was now to be with her mistress, and I found it a happy one. My mistress was so kind to me that I was always glad to do her bidding proud to labor for her as much as my young years would permit. She taught me how to read and write. I would sit by her side for hours, sewing diligently, with a heart as free from care as any freeborn white child. When she thought I was tired, she would send me out to run and jump, and away I bounded to gather berries or flowers to decorate her room. Those were happy days.
twelve years old, my mistress became very ill. And as I saw the cheek grow paler, and the eye more glassy, how earnestly I prayed that she might live. I loved her, for she had been like a mother to me. But my prayer was not answered. She died, and they buried her in the little churchyard where day after day my tears fell upon her grave. The will of my mistress was read, and we learned that she had bequeathed me to her sister's daughter, a child of five years old, the daughter of Dr. Flint. <coughs> Dr. Flint was a physician in the neighborhood and had married the sister of my mistress, so I had become the property of their little daughter when I was 12 years old. When I entered their home for the first time, there were cold looks, cold words, and cold treatment. I rejoiced when the night came. During the first years of my service in Dr. Flint's family, I was accustomed to share some indulgences with the children of my mistress. And though this seemed no more than right, I was grateful for it and tried to merit the kindness by the faithful discharge of my duties. As I entered my 15th year, a sad epoch in the life of a slave girl, my master began to whisper foul words in my ear. Young as I was, I could not remain ignorant of their import. I tried to treat them with indifference or contempt. My master's age, my extreme youth, and the fear that his conduct would be reported to my grandmother made me bear this treatment for many months. He was a crafty man, and he resorted to any means to accomplish his purpose. Sometimes he had stormy, terrifying ways that made me tremble. Sometimes he assumed a gentleness that he thought must surely subdue. Of the two, I preferred the stormy moods, although they left me trembling. He tried to corrupt the poor principles my grandmother had instilled. He peopled my young mind with unclean images, such as only a vile monster could think of. I turned from him with disgust and hatred. But he was my master. I was compelled to live under the same roof with him, where I saw a man 40 years my senior, daily violating the sacred commandments of nature. He told me that I was his property, and that I must be subject to his will in all things. My soul revolted against the mean tyranny. All the days and nights of fear and sorrow that death cost me. It is not to awaken sympathy for myself that I am telling you truthfully what I suffered in slavery, but to kindle a flame of compassion in your hearts for my sisters who are still in bondage suffering as I once suffered. Did you ever hate? I never did but once, and I trust I never shall again. Somebody has called it the atmosphere of hell, and I believe it is so. No matter whether the slave girl be as black as ebony or as fair as her mistress, there is no shadow of the law to protect her from insult, from violence, or even from death. All these are inflicted by fiends who bear the shape of men. And the mistress who ought to protect the helpless victim has no other feelings toward her but jealousy and rage. Mrs. Flint, Mrs. Flint, like many Southern women, was totally deficient in energy. She had not enough strength to superintend her household affairs. But her nerves were so strong that she could sit in her easy chair and see a woman whipped till blood trickled from every stroke of the lash. 
she was a member of the church, but partaking of the Lord's Supper did not seem to put her in the Christian frame of mind. If dinner was not served at the exact time, she would station herself in the kitchen and spit in all the kettles and pans that had been used for cooking. She did this to prevent the cook and her children from eking out their meager fare with the remains of the gravy and other scrapings. I can assure you, she gave them no chance to eat wheat bread from her flour barrel. Provisions were weighed out by the pound and ounce three times a day. She knew exactly how many biscuits a quart of flour would make and exactly what size they ought to be. My master met me at a return, reminding me that I belonged to him and swearing by heaven and earth that he would compel me to submit to him. If I went out for a breath of fresh air, his footsteps dogged me. If I knelt by my mother's grave, his dark shadow fell on me even there. as I entered my 16th year. Every day it became more apparent that my presence was intolerable to Mrs. Flint. Angry words frequently passed between her and her husband. He had never punished me himself, and he would never allow anybody else to punish me. In that respect, she was never satisfied. But in her angry moods, no terms were too vile for her to bestow upon me. Yet I had more pity for her than he had whose duty it was to make her life happy. I never wronged her or wished to wrong her. One word of kindness would have brought me to her feet. After repeated quarrels between the doctor and his wife, he announced his intention to take his youngest daughter, then four years old, to sleep in his apartment. It was necessary that a servant should sleep in the same room to be on hand if the child stirred. I was selected for the office. A kind providence interposed in my favor. During the day, Mrs. Flint heard of this new arrangement, and a storm followed. I rejoiced to hear it rage. Later, my mistress sent for me to come to her room. Do you know you were to sleep in the doctor's room? Yes, ma'am. Who told you? My master. Will you answer truthfully all the questions I ask? Yes, ma'am. Tell me then, as you hope to be forgiven, are you innocent of what I have accused you? I am. Lay your hand on your heart, kiss this holy book, and swear before God that you tell me the truth. You have taken God's holy word to testify your innocence. If you have deceived me, beware. Now sit down, look me directly in the face, and tell me all that has passed between your master and you. I did as I was told. As I went on with my account, she wept and sometimes groaned. She spoke in tones so sad that I was touched by her grief. But I soon learned that her emotions arose from anger and wounded pride. She felt that her marriage vows were desecrated her dignity insulted. She pitied herself as a martyr, but she was incapable of feeling for the condition of shame and misery in which I was placed. But oh, ye happy women, whose purity has been sheltered from childhood, who have been free to choose the objects of affection, whose homes are shielded by the laws, do not judge the poor, desolate slave girl too severely. Why does a slave ever love? Why allow the tendrils of the heart to twine around objects which may at any moment be wrenched away by the hand of violence? When I was a young girl I loved, and I indulged in the hope that the dark clouds around me would soon turn out a bright lining. I forgot in the land of my birth that the shadows were too dense for light to penetrate. There was in the neighborhood 
a young colored carpenter, a freeborn man. We had been acquainted in childhood and frequently met together afterwards. And he proposed to marry me. I loved him with the ardor of a young girl's first love. But when I reflected that I was a slave and that the laws gave no sanction to the marriage of such, my heart sank within me. My lover wanted to buy me, but I knew that Dr. Flint was too willful and arbitrary a man to consent to that arrangement. So you want to be married to you and to a free nigger? Yes, sir. Well, if you must have a husband, you can take up with one of my slaves. Don't you suppose, sir, that a slave has some preference about marrying? Do you suppose that all men are alike to her? Do you love this nigger? Yes, sir. How dare you tell me so? Never let me hear that fellow's name again, or ever catch him lurking about my premises, or I will cowhide you both. Do you hear what I say? I'll teach you a lesson about marriage and free niggers. Now go, and let this be the last time I have occasion to speak to you on this subject. and his wife's jealousy started to give rise to some gossip in the neighborhood. Among others, it chanced that a white, unmarried gentleman had obtained some knowledge of the circumstances of which I was placed. Samuel Treadwell Sawyer he often spoke to me in the street, and he became interested in me and asked me questions about my master, which I answered in part. He constantly sought opportunities to see me and wrote to me frequently. I was a slave girl, only 16 years old. So much attention from a superior person was, of course, flattering, for human nature is the same in all. I also felt grateful for his sympathy and encouraged by his kind words. 
It seemed to me a great thing to have such a friend. By degrees, a more tender feeling crept into my heart. Of course, I saw whither all this was tending. I knew the impassable gulf between us. But to be an object of interest to a man who was not married, and who was not her master, is agreeable to the pride and feeling of a slave. If her miserable situation has left her any pride or sentiment, there is something akin to freedom in having a lover who has no control over you, except that which he gains by kindness. Moreover, the wrong does not seem so great with an unmarried man as with one who has a wife. There may be sophistry in all this, but the condition of a slave confuses all principles of morality, and in fact, renders the practice of them impossible. Dr. Flint was building a cottage for me in a secluded place, part of his new plan to have me. For months he told me of his intended arrangements, and I was silent. I knew nothing would enrage him so much as to know that I favored another. And it was something to triumph over my tyrant, even in a small way. I thought that Dr. Flint would revenge himself by selling me. And I was sure my friend, Mr. Sawyer, would buy me. He was a man of more generosity and feeling than my master. And I thought my freedom could be easily obtained from him. At last the doctor came told me the cottage was completed and ordered me to go to it. I told him that I would never enter it. You shall go if you are carried by force and shall remain there. I will never go there. In a few months I shall be a mother. He stood and looked at me with dumb amazement and left me without a word. I thought I should be happy in my triumph over him. But now the truth was out, and my relatives would hear of it. I felt wretched. How could I look them in the face? My self-respect was gone. I went to my grandmother's. My lips moved to make confession, but the word stuck in my throat. My grandmother, whose suspicions had been previously awakened, exclaimed, Has it come to this? I had rather see you dead than to see you as you now are. You are a disgrace to your dead mother. Go away and never come to my house again. Where could I go? I was afraid to return to my masters. I walked on recklessly, not caring where I was going or what would become of me. When I had gone on for about five miles, fatigue compelled me to stop. I sat down on the stump of an old tree. The stars were shining through the boughs above me. How they mocked me with their clear, calm light. The hours passed by, and as I sat there alone, a chilliness and sickness came over me. I sank on the ground. My mind was full of horrid thoughts. I prayed to die. But my prayer was not answered. At last, I roused myself and walked some distance further to the house of a woman who had been a friend of my mother's. When I told her why I was there, she spoke soothingly to me. But I could not be comforted. I thought that I could bear my shame if I could only be reconciled to my grandmother. 
the friend sent for my grandmother. And she came at last. I told her the things that had poisoned my life, how long I had been persecuted, that I saw no way to escape, and I had become more desperate. I told her that I would bear anything and do anything if in time I could have her forgiveness. I begged of her to pity me for my dead mother's sake. And she did pity me. She did not say, I forgive you. But she looked on me lovingly, with her eyes full of tears. She laid her old hand gently on my head and murmured, poor child, poor child. I had returned to my good grandmother's house. She had an interview with Mr. Sawyer. He promised to care for my child and to buy me. Be the conditions what they might. My first child was a son. I named him Joseph. When he was born, they told me he was premature. He weighed only four pounds, but God let him live. I heard the doctor say that I could not survive till morning. I had often prayed for death, but now I did not want to die, unless my child could die too. Many weeks passed before I was able to leave my bed. I was a mere wreck of my former self. My baby was also sickly. His little limbs were often racked with pain. Dr. Flint continued his visits to look after my health, and he did not fail to remind me that my child was an addition to his stock of slaves. Many months passed by, and my boy improved in health. When he was a year old, they called him beautiful. The little vine was taking deep root into my existence. Though its clinging fondness excited both a mixture of love and pain. When I was most sorely oppressed, I found solace in his smiles. I loved to watch his infant slumber. But there was a dark cloud over my enjoyment. I could never forget that he was a slave. I prayed that he might die in infancy. God tried me. My darling became very ill. The bright eyes grew dull, and the little hands and feet were so icy cold that I thought death had already touched him. I had prayed for his death, but never so earnestly as I now pray for his life. and my prayer was heard. Alas, what mockery it is for a slave mother to try and pray back her dying child to life. Death is better than slavery. Dr. Flint learned that I was again to be a mother. He was enraged beyond measure. He pitched me down.